Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Eric Eich. I'm with the UBC Department of Psychology. And on behalf of the department, I'd like to welcome you to this, the fifth annual Quinn Memorial Lecture. Um, the lecture is named after this gentleman, who is uh, Dr. Michael J. Quinn. He's an alumnus of UBC who passed away in 2005. Um, the eldest of nine children, Dr. Quinn left home at 17 to work at a variety of very hard scrabble jobs, including heavy manual labor in Alberta sawmill, so that he could save enough money to put himself through university. So no silver spoon or he. Um, Dr. Quinn entered the UBC grad department in clinical psychology in 1965, and he received his doctorate in 1969. He was only the second person to receive a PhD from the UBC psychology department. Um, afterwards, he went on to have a long and distinguished career as a clinical psychologist at Riverview Hospital over in Coquitlam. And, but whether as a psychology student here at UBC or as a practicing clinician at Riverview, Dr. Quinn always had an abiding interest in memory, consciousness, and cognition. So in order to promote basic research in these areas, Dr. Quinn bequeathed to the psych department an extraordinary endowment of $1.4 million. Um, that amount was later raised to a little over $1.6 million thanks to the generosity of our Dean of Arts, Nancy Gallini. Um, the interest on that endowment is being used to fund a number of innovative programs, one of which is the annual Quinn Memorial Lecture. So in keeping with Dr. Quinn's wishes, the lecture is intended to highlight cutting-edge research in memory, consciousness, and cognition that has theoretical as well as practical or real-world significance. That's exactly the kind of research that Dan Schachter does and will describe for us today. A uh, native New Yorker, Dan earned his bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of North Carolina and his PhD in cognitive psychology from the University of Toronto, where he, was a stu he studied under Endel Tolving. Um, upon graduation, Dan took up an assistant professorship at the University of Arizona uh, before moving to Harvard University in 1991. Dan served as chair at Harvard's psychology department from 1995 to 2005. And then I think you got re recruited back in for an emergency six-month stint. And in 2002, Dan was honored with an endowed professorship uh, named for William uh, R. Keenan, Jr. Uh, Dan's research focuses on the psychological and neurological basis of human memory and amnesia. His early work laid the foundation for the really crucial distinction between explicit and implicit memory, remembering with or without awareness in some colloquial sense. Uh, his more recent work has provided important insights into the aging brain, distortions of memory, and recollections of trauma, among many other topics. His research involves both cognitive testing and brain imaging techniques, uh, particularly functional magnetic resonance imaging. Dan's published over 200 scientific uh, articles and chapters. Uh, for several years, he's been the world's most cited psychologist in any area of psychology. And he has a long uh, laundry list of major awards, including the Arthur Benton Award from the International Neuropsychological Society, the Distinguished Scientific uh, Award for Early Career Contribution from the American Psychological Association, the Trollin Research Award from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and a John Su uh, Guggenheim Fellowship uh, most recently. Dan's 1996 book, Searching for Memory, was named one of the Library Journal's best science and technology books and, and uh, was also cited as by the New York Times as one of its notable books for the year for 1996. Searching for Memory also earned for Dan the 1997 APA William James Book Award and if that weren't enough, he did this likewise with his 2001 book called Seven Sins of Memory. Today, Dan will discuss his pioneering work on the interplay between memory for events of the personal past on one hand and one's ability to imagine future episodes or experiences on the other. So ladies and gentlemen, would you gather with me and welcome Dan Schachter. Well, thank you very much, Eric, for that nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and to be counted among the speakers in this uh, 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 impressive lecture series. Uh, it's also a, sp a special ple pleasure to be introduced by Eric. Uh, we were graduate students together back at the University of Toronto uh, over 30 years ago now and have remained friends and colleagues since. So uh, thank you very much again for, for the introduction. Um, Today I'm going to be talking about uh, a fairly recent uh, body of, of work in, in our laboratory that uh, is in some ways an, a new departure for us, but in many ways relates to some classic uh, issues in, in memory research and maybe represents a, a, a slightly different way of, of getting at them. And 
uh, as you can see by the title of the talk, Constructive Rem Memory to uh, Remembering the Past to Imagine the Future, we're going to be talking about the idea of memory as a constructive process on the one hand, and then we're going to be approaching it for the bulk of the talk by looking at research that shows the interrelationship between uh, remembering past events and imagining future events. And I'm going to try to connect these two things together. But let's start with uh, a historical um, acknowledgement uh, to uh, a very well-known psychologist uh, whose name would be familiar to uh, um, just about any psychologist in the room and who's one of the true pioneers of the notion that memory is a constructive process rather than a very simple reproduction or a literal replay or replica of the past, and that's Sir Frederick Bartlett. And back in 1932, Bartlett published a uh, book well known today called Remembering, uh, in which he kind of took, took issue with the prevailing dogma about memory uh, of the time in a number of ways. Uh, he tried to study memory in a more naturalistic way than his predecessors dating back to uh, Ebbinghaus, who of course initiated the scientific study of memory in 1885 than Ebbinghaus and others had by exposing people to stories. And his observations of how people remembered these stories convinced him that indeed memory is far from a simple reproduction of the past, because when people remembered stories in his experiments, they didn't just give him a replay of what they had read, uh, rather they made a variety of interesting errors and distortions uh, that reflected uh, the influence of complex processes he referred to as schemas that he thought played a large role in memory. And these observations uh, led Bartlett to this uh, quote, one of, probably one of the better one known from his 1932 book, the first notion to get rid of is that memory is primarily or literally reduplicative or reproductive. In a world of constantly changing environment, literal recall is extraordinarily unimportant. Memory appears to be an affair of construction rather than reproduction. And what Bartlett meant uh, when he talked about memory as a constructive process, or what I mean when I, t I should say when I talk about memory as a constructive process, uh, uh, pretty similar to what Bartlett meant, um, is that when we remember in a past event, far from simply shining a light on a, a little picture in the head or anything like that, we're engaging in a constructive process in which we're linking together bits and pieces of information from different sources, different components or elements of an episode, who was there, uh, what, did, what did things look like when this event happened, what, are, what did things sound like, what, what did things taste like, if that's relevant, and our prior general knowledge and belief. And it's kind of the linking together of these diverse elements that, construct, that results in the construction of an episode that, that we call uh, a memory. And I think uh, uh, Bartlett was really proven to be right by many later experiments. It took a while for his contributions to be recognized with people like Elizabeth Loftus, who uh, spoke in this lecture series a couple of years ago, back in the 1970s, and, and many others uh, have, have carried out compelling studies of memory distortions, I think, that have largely proven this to be uh, uh, a, a good way to think about uh, memory. Where I'm going to go today is to also suggest that, in his thinking, he was on the right uh, track about function. One interesting question we can pose about, about memory as a constructive process is what function does that serve? Why is it that we have a memory where we sometimes make errors and distortions, where we can misidentify eyewitnesses in real wor world settings with very high confidence, sometimes resulting in incorrect, uh, wrongful uh, convictions? Why do we have a, a memory that's so prone to error? Well, there are a variety of ideas about that. And I think that Bartlett, in this sentence here where he's talking about how in a world where the environment changes constantly, where the past and the future are really not the same thing, little recall is really not what you want in memory. That's not necessarily going to be the uh, most uh, adaptive kind of memory because uh, the future is not a replica of the past. I'm going to kind of try to pursue that, that thought that uh, Nason thought that he had about function. But to do that, I'm now going to sort of switch gears a little bit and take you back to the early 1980s. Shortly after I'd gotten my PhD at the, at the University of Toronto, I stayed on there for a number of years, and I was doing research uh, 
with brain damage uh, amnesic patients uh, in the unit for memory disorders, still working some with uh, Endel Tolving. And a patient came on the scene back then in the early 80s, uh, referred to in the literature nowadays as patient KC. He was a head injury patient who was severely amnesic. Uh, he had virtually no ability to uh, create and retain uh, uh, an episodic memory, that is a memory of a particular event occurring in a particular time and place, uh, that he could retain over time. Nor could he remember a single episode from his past. He had some general knowledge. Well, Tolving at the time was uh, interested in extending his ideas about episodic memory uh, uh, in, in a way that would encompass not only the, the past, we use memory to revisit the past, but also the idea that we could use episodic memory to kind of travel in time both to the past and the future. So he was interested in probing this patient, uh, not only his memory, but also his ability to think about the future. And this is a little extract from an article that Tolving published in Canadian Psychology in 1985 that talks about this case. Um, he was referring to him here as NN. In subsequent studies, he, he, uh, publications, he came to be referred to as patient KC. Um, and he talks about how uh, he and I had been observing this guy. And he presents uh, kind of a, uh, a brief clip from an interview uh, that I was uh, present at. We were both testing him that day for different things, in which he asked him about not only could you remember, can you remember what happened yesterday? Well, he can't remember anything about what happened yesterday. But he said, what, you know, he asked him, what do you think might happen tomorrow? What, what's going to happen when you leave here? What will you be doing tomorrow? And he came up with as big a blank in trying to imagine a future event as he had when trying to remember a past event. And so here's a question where he's saying, well, let's try this question again about the future. What will you be doing tomorrow? There's a pause. And then the patient smiles faintly and says, I don't know. Uh, do you remember the question? After, he all, after all, he is amnesic. But indeed, he remembers it about what I'll be doing tomorrow. And Telving says, yeah, how would you describe your state of mind when you try to think about it? Five second pause. And then he says, blank, I guess. And this was really a very striking observation, both to Tolving and to me. And at least in my mind, initially planted the seeds that there might be a very interesting connection in memory uh, between our ability to remember the past and imagine future events. Here's an amnesic patient. Why couldn't he, why couldn't he tell us what's going to happen tomorrow? I mean, he could say, I'll have breakfast, then I'll have lunch. But he couldn't, couldn't come up with any uh, particular episodes. Uh, so this kind of a planet a seed in my mind. Tolving wrote about this in the context of mental time travel, but nobody did much about this connection between remembering the past and imagining the future for a long time. And, and one reason for that is it's a very hard thing to study how people imagine sim uh, uh, future events, think ahead to future events, or simulate what might happen to us in the future, even though it's something we do all the time. Uh, before coming to the, you know, give this talk, I kind of try to project ahead to people I'm going to see and think about what I might say and think about how this talk might go. In other words, I try out different al alternative uh, possible realities. Um, and, well, how would you really study that? And that sort of kept me out of, uh, out of, out of working on this issue for, for a long time because it seems somewhat intractable. Interestingly, however, about uh, during the last few years, there's been a sudden upsurge in research as a number of labs, including our own, and I'll get into the reasons why in a minute, have started to try to tackle this, this relationship between remembering the past and imagining the future uh, empirically. And that's led to a very interesting set of findings uh, pointing out intriguing commonalities between past and future events. So, uh, following on uh, Tolving's initial and formal observations, a couple of more recent uh, studies have shown that in more, more systematically in that amnesic patients who have difficulties remembering the past do indeed have documentable difficulties imagining uh, uh, personal uh, future episodes or novel scenes. Stan Klein and his colleagues in 2002 published a paper that more systematically so showed this in a patient who had become amnesic after an episode of uh, uh, anoxia or loss of oxygen. And then more recently, uh, Demis Hassabis, Eleanor McGuire, and their group in London uh, showed 
uh, in a group of patient, amnesic patients with documented damage to the hippocampus, of course, the cr a critical region for episodic memory, um, had difficulty imagining future scenes. They would come up with very sketchy uh, uh, imag imaginings of novel scenes that had very little uh, detail in them compared to control subjects. Uh, there had been one study in the 90s uh, by Michael Williams and his colleagues with severely depressed patients that looked at um, uh, episodic, the episodic specificity of their autobiographical memories when they remembered past events, how specific were those memories, and compared those to the specificity of future events that they would imagine in response to cues, and they found that there was a reduction in episodic specificity. These patients tend to remember the past in an overgeneral way, and that was paralleled uh, in over, kind of overgeneral uh, imaginings of future events. There are a couple of cognitive studies that uh, came on the scene, 2004 and 6, from Dergenbo and van der Linden, showing that manipulations and individual difference variables had strikingly similar effects on past and future events. Really where we got involved with this is doing neuroimaging uh, studies, uh, in which a number of studies, and more since, uh, more since these, uh, have shown striking, strikingly similar activation patterns when people remember past events uh, and imagine future events, uh, where the typical finding is here, you're asking people to remember a past event, imagine something, imagine something that might occur, and you find that a number of regions that have been previously implicated uh, in memory uh, show similar activations when people imagine the future, including the hippocampus, a critical part of the medial temporal lobe memory system. This and a lot of other recently appearing uh, research was, uh, has been reviewed in, in a number of places. I'll just point you, for those who are interested, to a couple of reviews on this topic by Donna Addis, Randy Buckner, and I, a brief one in Nature Reviews Neuroscience in 2007, and a longer one in the uh, Year in Cognitive uh, Neuroscience uh, series, edited by Mike Miller and Alan Kingstone here, published in the uh, Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences in, in 2008. And pulling together some of these uh, developments, what we proposed in, uh, in those papers, uh, this is taken from the Nature Reviews article, a figure, is that uh, there might be a core network involved that is involved not only in remembering past events, but also in imagining future events and carrying out some related kinds of mental simulations. Um, this network, for those of you uh, familiar with the cognitive neuroscience literature, overlaps to a large extent with what is known as the default network in the, lit in the literature. And this is basically uh, the, a similar collection of regions that people had noticed, intriguingly, uh, become very active during what might, might be considered periods of rest. When people are in the scanner and just staring at a fixation crosshair, uh, cognitive neuroscientists kind of hoped that that would be a nice passive control task with which they could p compare brain activity. But lo and behold, the brain wasn't dead during those periods. It was active. Uh, it was alive, and it was alive apparently with thoughts of the past and the future, uh, or possibly, because many of these regions that we see are active during remembering the past and um, imagining the future are, are active during these uh, apparently ep uh, apparent episodes of spontaneous cognition when people are staring at a crosshair but actually probably remembering uh, and imagining. And prominent in, these, in, in this uh, network are midline uh, posterior regions in the uh, medial parietal area, including uh, precuneus going into retrosplenial cortex, medial prefrontal regions, a couple of lateral temporal and parietal regions, and of course, so of great interest to memory researchers, uh, the medial temporal lobe, including the hippocampus. Okay, so that's a, uh, I'm condensing uh, a story that I'm going to unpack a little bit as we go into some of our individual studies where we've seen some of the evidence for this. How does this all re relate to constructive memory where I began? These are nice striking overlaps. Well, in light of some of our prior work on constructive memory and memory distortion um, that provided kind of a conceptual backdrop, in light of some of these findings, Donna Addis and I have proposed what we call the constructive episodic simulation hypothesis. And this is basically a way conceptually of trying to link up some of that work on constructive memory, kind of in the Bartlett tradition, if you will, with some of this work showing striking parallels 
in the neural and cognitive processes involved in remembering the past and imagining the future. And there are three key, key components uh, to this idea. Number one, which I say, would say is not really controversial in the field, is that episodic memory involves constructive processes. Um, and not only in the cognitive sense, um, discussed by Bartlett many years ago, but I think many people in cognitive neuroscience would kind of subscribe to this general consensus view that uh, details of episodic memories are stored as fragments in cortical regions devoted to particular kinds of processing. And again, during retrieval, as we discussed earlier, uh, uh, we have a reactivation of these elements where they're reactivated by these cortices and then reintegrated perhaps by the hippocampus into a coherent event. So that's one component of this hypothesis. Now, linking up to imagining the future, uh, we have suggested that this very constructive nature of episodic memory makes it very extremely well suited to building simulations of possible future events because the system is set up so that we can easily kind of extract details from past events, extract elements of episodes, and flexibly recombine those details into simulations uh, of events that might happen. We can use our past flexibly and kind of rearrange it, reassemble it, or recombine it uh, to anticipate uh, possible unfolding future scenarios. We can think about different ways in which uh, future events might unfold in light of our prior uh, experiences. And we suggested in our theoretical writings on this that this process of recombination might indeed rely heavily on uh, what people have termed relational capacity, uh, processing capacities supported by the hippocampal region. There's a body of evidence out there from Neil Cohn, Howard Eichenbaum, and others suggesting that the hippocampal area is particularly important for linking together, binding, or relating um, previously uh, unrelated elements. So our idea is that some of these hippocampal act activities may reflect this recombination process. And then the third component of this idea, of this general uh, hypothesis uh, is what links it most directly to memory distortion and constructive memory, and that is that although this kind of system is very well suited to simulating future events in light of past experiences, the constructive nature of episodic memory has a cost, and that cost is the kind of our, our occasional vulnerability to miscombining details from different episodes that can result in memory errors commonly studied in the laboratory, such as false recognition. Um, so that's basically our notion, is that a fun one of the functions of a constructive memory may be giving us the flexibility to use the past to anticipate a future, but it has this well-known cost. So what I want to do with the rest of my time now is tell you about two kinds of evidence that we have obtained relevant to different aspects of this uh, constructive simulation hypothesis. First, I'm going to walk you through a couple of the neuroimaging studies we've done, three neuro, uh, fMRI studies we've done on this topic, and we're going to focus specifically on this notion of recombination and the role of the hippocampal region. Then I'm going to move over to some work on behavioral aging, uh, purely behavioral studies of older adults that have been initially stimulated by this hypothesis and are, and are uh, now going in, a, in an interesting new direction. Okay, so let me tell you about this first study uh, that we carried out. Um, uh, this is led by Donna Addis, who has led uh, to date all of our work, uh, uh, empirical work on this topic. Um, and I mentioned earlier that one of the, one of the real problems uh, in studying uh, imagination or simulation of future events is that it experimentally does not lend itself as easily to study as, as the kinds of things that we memory psychologists normally study. We know how to give people a list of words or pictures and then later give them a memory test. We have control over the input, we have control over the output, but if I'm looking at someone's ability to imagine what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, it's, it's difficult to control everything in the way that uh, people from the Ebbinghaus tradition like, like me uh, are used to. So that was always part of my pause in getting involved in research on this area as my thoughts about it percolated over the past 25 years. But uh, a body of work had arisen in cognitive neuroscience on autobiographical memory, 
that showed that, in fact, if you did simple autobiographical cueing paradigms where you give people a word cue, ask them to remember past experiences, that you could get very reliable and replicable, replicable results. So Donna Addis had done some of that work, and she came to my lab as a postdoc, and we started talking about trying to extend it uh, to the domain of uh, imagining future events. And here's the paradigm uh, that we came up with uh, to begin with. We were going to use event-related uh, fMRI, and what we wanted to do is try to, try to decompose uh, remembering past events and imagining future events into two, what we thought were two component uh, stages that we call construction and elaboration. So, for, for example, suppose I give you a word cue such as table, and I say, remember an event that happened in the last week having to do with the table. It's going to take you a few seconds now to rummage around, and probably most of you have come up with some event that occurred to you uh, involving a table. That's what we would call the construction phase of remembering. And now I could say to you, okay, now I want you to fill in all the details of that event. Try to remember it as vividly uh, as possible. We'll call that the elaboration phase, when you've got the memory in mind and you elaborate on it. Analogously, you can do the same thing in trying to imagine a future event. I could say, imagine an event that might occur involving a table to you, plausibly given your plans, within the next couple of weeks. It will take you a few seconds to uh, uh, come up with an event. Uh, then you come up with an event, and now I can tell you to elaborate on it. So that was the very simple paradigm we used uh, uh, to get started on this. Uh, we cued people to recall past events or imagine future events. Uh, we stressed that the future events should be novel and plausible. And we, uh, we asked about three time periods for uh, no, uh, past and future events, last the next week, last the next year, and last the next 20 years. I'm going to be collapsing across that and then the results I'll show you. Uh, importantly, subjects describe these events in a post-scan session. One, one of the other things that makes this kind of work methodologically a real challenge is that because, uh, because it creates motion artifact, you really don't want and can't have people talking in the scanner online as they're remembering or imagining. So you have them tell you about the events afterwards. And to make sure that, that what you're getting afterwards corresponds pretty well with what goes on in the magnet, we did a lot of pilot work uh, in, uh, in, in the behavioral lab uh, in comparing various conditions where we had people talk out loud during a mock scan, comparing that to what we got later on in post-event scans, and all that convinced us that what people said later is what is actually going on in, in the scanner. So that's certainly an issue we've been concerned with. This just shows a schematic of what I've told you about. Uh, you show the Q word. It could be um, something like car uh, for, for two seconds. Uh, then there's the construction phase. Happily, it turns out that it takes people around seven or eight seconds both to construct a past event, a remembered event, or imagine a future event. Uh, so we don't have any problems with reaction time differences. And then they elaborate on the event out to 20 seconds. And then they um, do various ratings. Uh, we rate the detail, have them rate the detail of the event on a one to five scale. One, very little detail. Five, a lot of detail. Hold that in mind because that'll be important in a follow-up study. We have them rate the emotion. And uh, we also try to hold constant whether they remember these events from a field perspective as if seeing it from their own eyes or an observer perspective as seeing themselves in the, old, in, in the memory. We instruct them all to remember these events from a, an observer perspective. Um, so we, because we didn't want to have any confoundings with field observer, uh, of course, this is something that Eric Eich and his colleagues have worked on quite a bit here. Everyone's instructed to remember or imagine from a field perspective. Now, these are complex tasks, and certainly if you just look at what's going on during these tasks, you're going to get activity kind of all over the brain. So as in any imaging study, you have to really ask the question, well, activity in these conditions compared to what conditions? So we use basic, a couple of different non-episodic control tasks where we try to control for some of the complex cognitive processes that would go on in the remembering and imagining task, but, uh, but tasks that don't involve an episodic memory or imagining component. So one of the controls, you get a word as before. You have to come up with a sentence uh, involving two related words. You push a button when you come up with a sentence, then you elaborate on it 
That takes roughly the same amount of time as the remembering and imagining tasks. And they also do a visual spatial control test. You give them a word, and you have them imagine objects in a triangular arrangement, one bigger, one smaller than a leaf, everything uh, as before. And these ended up working very well as control tests. They were well matched in, in a number of ways. Well, there are a lot of data from this study, from this study and I'm just going to, again, focus you, as I mentioned earlier, primarily on the hippocampal component. Now, one of the things that got us very excited early on when we first uh, got these results is that when we looked at the construction phase, what jumped out, jumped out at us immediately is that uh, in, the, in this case, the left hippocampus, we saw activity both during remembering the past and imagining the future uh, and to a greater extent than during the control task. And this is, to us, pretty striking and somewhat surprising that when you have people just imagine something that might occur that's not really retrieving a real memory that you'd get the same amount of hippocampal activation. We also saw various other regions activating commonly during this construction phase, uh, including some posterior regions probably involved in cue processing and object recognition. Um, and then during the uh, construction phase, we also saw, perhaps even more strikingly, that there were a few different regions that showed selective activations when you imagine the future uh, more so than when you remember the past. In fact, there wasn't anything going on in these regions during memory, but there was during future uh, imagination. And again, there were several regions that showed this pattern, but strikingly, there was a region in the right uh, anterior hippocampus that showed this selective, selective activation uh, during uh, imagining. And uh, there are a couple of ways of thinking about that. One, you might say, well, why, why would the hippocampus selectively for, uh, activate for an imagined episode? We know that the hippocampus activates for novel information when you encode novel information into memory. And you could think of this as kind of an encoding, uh, active encoding, so maybe that's what's going on. Closely related idea, the one that we favor, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, uh, is that this might be a signature of recombining details to form specific imagined episode along lines discussed in our constructive uh, episodic simulation uh, hypothesis. I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but again, this was another striking finding, and to us, quite surprising and somewhat unexpected, that you would see a hippocampal activation more in imagination uh, than in memory. Again, there were other regions that showed this pattern, but I won't, won't go into our, our thinking on that right now. During the elaboration phase, uh, we saw even, even more striking overlap. This slide is a little bit dark, but that basically you're seeing those um, midline regions we talked about earlier as being prominent players in the default network coming online during re periods of rest are similarly active when you're remembering past events compared to the control and also when you're uh, imagining future events uh, uh, during the control. So there's also when you're imagining future events compared to the control condition. Um, and then just looking at some of the same data from a slightly different perspective, you can see again that there are a number of regions in that core network that are coming online during elaboration similarly for um, past events and future events and to a greater extent uh, than during the uh, control condition. Again, all prominent players in what we have called the core network, which largely maps onto the uh, default network. Again, I won't go through all the different ideas about what might be going on here, but let's just talk a minute about uh, the hippocampal activation, um, where we didn't really know, since it was occurring uh, for both remembered events and imagined events, a little bit more for remembered events, but not statistically different. Uh, whether this might reflect re, uh, reintegrating details from past episodes. In other words, maybe this is some neural activity associated with bringing together elements of past episodes that have been brought together before, or might it sig uh, be a signature related to recombining? So this is an issue that we followed up on in a later uh, study uh, where we took a different approach to kind of uh, analyzing uh, uh, the, the hippocampal activations during this elaboration phase, and we asked the question of whether hippocampal responses to rated detail, remember I told you earlier that people rate the detail in the memory or imagined event on a one to five scale, uh, we asked whether the hippocampal responses to detail were similar for past and future events. 
And we did so in the context of uh, the distinction I just mentioned that we dis we've discussed in our writings on the constructive episodic simulation hypothesis, namely that one difference between remembering the past and imagining the future is that when you're remembering, you're, re you're reintegrating details that have come together before, either whether you encoded the event or on pr prior recountings of the event, whereas with future events, you're doing this somewhat different uh, process of recombining details uh, of past events into some novel uh, construction. So we wanted to look at this distinction vis-a-vis -vis an analysis of hippocampal responses to detail. And the paradigm here is pretty much uh, the paradigm that I told you about earlier. It's just another way of analyzing those data. And what we're going to do now is kind of a correlational analysis where we're going to look at, uh, we're going to ask the question of what regions activities vary with detail for past events, future events, or both. Um, and the amount of detail in these events didn't differ on average. Uh, but here we do, and here we do what we call a parametric modulation analysis, again, at, just basically asking the question, what regions vary with the amount of detail? And that analysis showed a very interesting distinction, published in 2008 in the journal Hippocampus. You know a region's important when it has its own journal, as Hippocampus does. <laughs> I think there are only a couple of others that do. Uh, but what, what we see here is that a distinct, a, an interesting distinction between two parts of the hippocampus. The posterior hippocampal activity correlated both with past and future detail. More activity in the posterior hippocampus was associated with more detail in a remembered or imagined event. And we wondered whether that might be a signature associated with retrieving details from past events. Uh, those details also used for future events because it seems very uh, very similar, the two kinds of events uh, um, and the kind of uh, associated hippocampal activity is very similar. However, up in the anterior hippocampus, and this is a region that we had seen, had seen selectively activated for future events in, during the construction phase that I showed you earlier, what we found is that this anterior hippocampal activity correlates specifically selectively with future detail more activity in this region, more detail in an imagined event, but unrelated to the amount of detail in a remembered event. So we think that that indeed might be a, a kind of signature of this flexible recombination process that we're talking about, because that's something that you do for the uh, imagined future events that you don't do for the remembered past events. You recombine them. Now, intriguingly, there's a, an interesting study uh, led by Ali Preston, then in John Gabrielli's lab, uh, that shows a similar distinction in a totally different paradigm that I think provides some nice converging evidence on this point that I'm making about recombination. So let me just take a minute to walk you through their paradigm. What they did uh, was a task uh, totally different from the task I've been telling you about, in which subjects were given, while in the scanner, pairs of faces and houses. And one of the critical manipulations is that the same house could be paired with two different faces, and they'd just be told to remember these pairs. Um, they were also shown some uh, just face-face pairs. Then later on, I can give you a memory test where I can say, did, these, did this face appear with this house? Did this face appear with this house? Did these two faces appear together? And you'd say yes or no, depending on your memory. The critical, interesting condition in the Preston and all experiment, what I call here the AC condition, is one in which two faces are paired together that were never associated, were, were not directly paired, but were associated via a common association with this house. Now I ask you the question, not did these two uh, faces appear together, but I ask you, were these two faces related by virtue of appearing with the same house. Now you've kind of got to recombine elements from these two episodes flexibly in order to say, yeah, this guy was with the, with one of the same house as, as this guy. What happens in the brain? Well, all four conditions similarly activate the posterior hippocampus. That's the same region that I just showed you correlates similarly with past and future detail. That gets activated during both remembering the standard memory conditions and during the, what I'm calling the recombination condition. 
Let's move up now to the anterior hippocampus. That's the region that in our study correlates selectively with future detail, not past detail. That region activates sele selectively for the condition in which you have to recombine knowledge from different episodes. So we think those two lines of evidence provide uh, some, you know, some converging evidence for this idea that the anterior hippocampal region may be playing an important role in flexible recombination. Let me just tell you about one more imaging study and then move on to some be, uh, purely behavioral work. I've been talking throughout this uh, lecture about comparison of remembering the past versus imagining the future, but maybe some of you will have noticed that there's, there's kind of a confound in the turn, uh, sense that experimental psychologists use between past and future and remembering and imagining. While, of course, we can, in a strict sense, only remember the past, we can both imagine future events, we can imagine present events, we can imagine events that might have occurred in the past. So we, we would want to ask the question, are the observed patterns we've seen so far specific to imagining future events, the kind of the imagining patterns, uh, are they associated with more general imagination or simulation activity? Is it really something that's something that's specifically and uniquely prospective about looking forward into the future, or is it something more general about imagination and simulation irrespective of whether you're looking forward or backward? Well, according to our constructive episodic simulation idea, this critical process of recombining event detail should occur regardless of whether individuals imagine an event is occurring in the future, present, or past, so we might expect, at least for the hippocampal bit, to see this pretty much the same pattern. Another important point here is that, you know, I've been focusing on this recombining of details across events uh, as a critical process in imagining, imagining the future. Uh, but it's also possible, there's another possibility. I haven't really shown you any direct evidence on it. And this is something that was raised to us when we first we reported our initial data, that maybe the reason why you, you see some of the patterns you do is that subjects simply remember entire events from the past and recast them in the future. So maybe when I give you the Q table and I say, imagine an event that might occur in the next week involving a table, you remember that you spilled coffee on the table last week and you think to yourself, well, that might happen this week. Maybe that accounts for some of the similarities and that doesn't account very naturally for the differences, but maybe there's some extra cognitive work in that recasting process that would explain some of the differences. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with recombining after all, despite the arguments I've tried to make. Um, so in our previous studies, these simulations could be based on recasting, recombining, or some combination of the two. So what we want to know is whether the main effects I've told you about are still observed when people are required to recombine elements of, of different episodes, which we really haven't done so far. So to get at these two issues, um, we devised something that we've referred to as the experimental recombination of details paradigm. This is where we're going to require our subjects to recombine events in a way that we didn't in the previous uh, work. So this is a fairly uh, time-intensive experiment. It's one where uh, we first have subjects come in and they uh, generate a memory pool of episodes. They come in and we have them provide us with uh, person, location, object, memories of real events from their everyday lives and they give a title to the memories and tell us something about them. So this memory, uh, the critical person is Katie, the location is Widener Library in the Harvard campus, the critical object is a hat, and the title of the memory is Fall Outside the Library, Graduation Day Memory, we've got Mom is the critical person, the location is Harvard Yard, object is a gown, and so on and so forth. So these are all re remembered events. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take those elements and we're going to recombine them and we're going to ask our subjects to take elements from either uh, three different memories or two different memories and imagine a future event that might plausibly occur with these three recombined details or imagine an event that might have occurred in the past involving these elements but didn't actually occur, but something that might have occurred to you sometime uh, in the past. So you're going to imagine into the future or the past with recombined details, and we're going to compare that to when you remember these real events. Um, and we also have a control task similar to the one before to try to con that I told you about before, kind of a combined semantic and visual spatial processing 
task involving uh, ordering objects by size in a sentence to try to control for some of those non-episodic processes that we're trying to uh, take out of our main findings. Uh, the, the, uh, the setup is similar. Uh, they see an event screen, uh, but now that tells them to imagine a past event, a future event, a recall an event. We give them the elements uh, to recombine, or we give them elements of three real memories and remember all three. Uh, we then have them do various rating tasks and so on. And we're going to focus on the data from the construction phase uh, of this experiment. Uh, this was just published in a, uh, a special issue of the uh, journal Neuropsychology on Episodic Memory in the Brain uh, in honor of Endel Tolving. There are quite a few interesting papers uh, in there for those of you who are interested. And I want to tell you about three findings from this, this study. Number one, we see that replicating our previous results under conditions of re experimental recombination, that when we ask the question, what regions in what regions is there common activity for future imagined, past imagined, and past recall versus the control task, what we pull out is basically that entire core network that I told you about uh, earlier, including uh, the hippocampus bilaterally, we've got the, uh, the midline regions, we've got some visual regions that tend to show up uh, in these studies that aren't, strictly speaking, uh, part of the default network, but we've got the entire core network coming out under conditions of experimental recombination. So we think what that tells us is that we think our prior findings on these commonalities are not likely due to a recasting process because you get the same thing when you've got people um, recombining under some experimental control. Number two, we now see an interesting distinction in this experiment uh, between uh, components of this network that we think might constitute subsystems of the, of the bigger core network. One we've referred to as an imagining subsystem, and this is, uh, this is a collection of regions whose activity is uh, closely associated with future imagining and past imagining to a greater extent with the control tasks, but not with remembering. And interestingly, and I think consistent with our uh, prior work on recombining the anterior hippocampus, that part that I was arguing on the previous data is specifically involved in recombining, that shows up in this imagining subsystem, I think, uh, buttresses some of the points uh, made earlier, uh, as well as a number of other regions within the core network. And there are also a number of regions that um, uh, correlate whose activity correlates specifically with past recall to a greater extent than past imagined, future imagined, or the control task. I'm not showing you all of them here. Uh, what I'm showing you here is that, interestingly, this analysis pulls out a posterior uh, region involved uh, in visual uh, processing. Uh, and one reason I mention that is that uh, one of the longstanding questions in kind of the true and false memory literature uh, as well as the memory imagination literature, is how do, we, how do we distinguish between events we've actually remembered and those we've only imagined, or those that uh, we may be, you know, we may think have occurred but haven't really occurred. And one of the answers that's been around, or hypotheses that have been around for a while, is known as the sensory reactivation hypothesis. And this is the idea that for actually experienced events, there may be a perceptual or sensory code uh, that is present uh, in a way that is not there for imagined events or, or inaccurately remembered events. That really goes back to the early work of Jonathan Schooler, Beth Loftus, and others. Uh, we've argued for it in some work with Scott Slotnick on True versus False Memories published a few years ago. And in that True versus False Memory paper, we indeed found that posterior visual regions showed greater activation for true than false memory. So it's interesting that some of these visual regions that may be involved with that sensory signature for actually remembered events distinguish the remembered from the imagined events. Okay, uh, I want to finish up in the last 10 minutes or so of my talk by moving on to some behavioral work where we've kind of taken a little bit of a different approach to looking at our constructive episodic, episodic simulation idea and to the way in which remembering the past and imagining the future are related to one another. And that's through some behavioral studies in normal aging. And these studies were uh, motivated uh, by, in part by some 
previous work conducted by Brian Levine and his colleagues in Toronto, who did some interesting work on autobiographical memory in older adults, people in their 70s and 80s primarily, uh, in which they found that when you ask people, older adults and younger adults, to remember real life past experiences, uh, and you give them a few minutes to do so, uh, that older adults seem to recall less of the what they call the internal details or episodic details of past episodes. Who was there? What happened? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Um, and instead, to re instead, remember more of what they called external details. External details are more facts, um, impressions, reflections, reactions, other events. Uh, stuff that might be part of an autobiographical memory, but is not stri strictly speaking part of the who, what, when core of that memory. And they did this by using a procedure that they call the autobiographical interview, where you ask people to remember an event, uh, have them uh, give as much detail as they can in five minutes, and then the critical part of this procedure is classifying each detail in the transcript as being e internal in the way that I just defined, or external. And they found that older adults show reduced internal and slightly increased uh, external details. Well, we wondered whether this same pattern might be seen in remembering uh, in imagining future uh, events. Um, so if both past and future events uh, draw on episodic memory, does the age-related reduction shown by Levine and colleagues in episodic specificity when remembering the past extend to future events? And According to our ideas, the answer to that is yes. And the first study we conducted along these lines published uh, last year in Psych Science. Uh, and it's basically doing the Levine study but ad adding a future imagine uh, condition. Those are some subject characteristics. Um, we adapted their autobiographical inter interview procedure uh, so that we asked people to recollect in detail events that occurred in the past few weeks or years or imagine events that might plausibly occur in the next few weeks or next few years. They're cued with the noun, they're given three minutes to recall or uh, imagine as much detail about the event as possible. And then the scoring, this is critical to the whole procedure, scoring these details as internal or external. Happily, uh, you get highly reliable uh, uh, scoring of these events from independent raters, a correlation is more than 0.9. So people agree on what's an internal detail and what's an external detail. And here's the critical result uh, from this study. Uh, this is basically a replication of what Levine and all saw when the older adults are remembering past events, fewer internal details, more external details. And then you can see when they're imagining future events, you get exactly the same pattern. It's a, really the mirror image of what happened when they remembered uh, uh, past events. Couldn't be really more mirror image than it is. Uh, you can look at correlations. Um, uh, within the subject groups uh, and what you see strikingly is that for both for internal and external detail there's a very strong positive correlation between past and future events people who give you more details about the past give you more details about the future uh, both for internal and external and yet internal and external details seem to behave rather differently they're totally uncorrelated with one another so more internal doesn't mean less external or uh, vice versa. Well, with those results in hand, we wanted to follow up uh, in a, another population and look at imagining the future in patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, with aging, of course, we don't have any known uh, brain pathology, um, but with Alzheimer's disease, we know that there is medial temporal lobe pathology. And we had reason to believe that uh, Alzheimer's patients would show reduced internal and perhaps even reduced external details for past events, would the same thing be seen uh, in, in, with future events? And again, the study is pretty much the same as I told you about uh, for the healthy older adults. We made it a little bit simpler uh, 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 so the Alzheimer patients uh, could follow along. And the bottom line from that study is we see another one of these striking parallels where the Alzheimer patients here shown in the gray bars indeed show reduced internal details compared to older adults for the past and they show pretty much the same kind of reduction when they're imagining future events. They also show modest 
but not significant reductions for external details. Importantly, because these are Alzheimer patients, they've got a lot of things, although relatively early, they've got a lot of uh, things wrong with them. You might worry that, well, maybe this pattern just shows they're worse at everything. They have a hard time coming up with words uh, or uh, thoughts when you, when you ask them uh, to do so in a, an extended several minute period. And indeed, we know that the Alzheimer patients show some m very mild verbal fluency deficits, a lot of problems coming up with words uh, if you just give them word beginnings and ask them to come up with what words start with an F, A, and S, for example, to take one well-known neuropsychological test. But this internal detail impairment uh, remains even when you control for that deficit. So we think this is a past-future parallel above and beyond what, um, what, what might be produced by any kind of general verbal fluency deficit. Well, with these results in hand, some additional questions came up that are very similar uh, and I'm focusing back on the healthy uh, older adults now that are very similar to the issues we discussed before are regarding the experimental recombination uh, paradigm. Is this striking similarity that I've just shown you between the past and future events happening because the older adults and younger adults for that matter just recast memories in the future condition. They come up with something that occurred in the past and talk about how that event might occur in the future. Um, or is it related, in, or is there any recombining going on, as we asked that question earlier? And again, are a, these age-related differences in imagining, uh, is it, is that have anything to do uh, specifically about an, an ability to project oneself into the future and imagine the future, or is it more general uh, than that? So to, to get at these questions, we use the experimental recombination procedure uh, that I told you about, whoops, that I just told you about in our imaging study, uh, but we adapted it to a behavioral study. This is coming out in the uh, journal Psychology and Aging, uh, most likely in a few months. And it's basically the same as I told you about for the um, fMRI study a few minutes ago, um, in which they come into the lab, they generate person, place, objects, memories, memories, and then we recombine those uh, memories into uh, stimuli for the second phase of the experiment uh, when they come back in and they either remember those events in as much detail as they can or they imagine recombined events. They're asked to imagine an event involving Katie, Harvard Yard, and a fajita, for example, from three different experiences and unpack that uh, imagined event in as much detail as possible. And we also ask them to do this about for past events uh, as well as for future events. So event, imagine events that might have occurred in the past but didn't. And we do the same kind of uh, decomposition into internal and external details using the autobiographical interview as before. Uh, and the results are pretty much the same as what I told you about before. Uh, here we're just looking at internal details and what you're going to see is that under conditions of experimental recombination and for both imagining the future and imagining the past, you get the same kind of age-related decrease in the ability to provide specific internal details about an episode uh, as you do when they remember, and then you get that same age-related increase uh, in external details. It couldn't really be more parallel under these conditions of experimental combination, uh, recombination and where people have to uh, imagine possible past events, and the correlations look pretty much the same as they uh, did before. Strong correlation uh, between past and future uh, imagination, f uh, future and past recall, and past imagination and recall. So basically the um, activity of imagining or simulating correlates strongly with memory regardless of whether you're imagining something that might have occurred in the past or might occur in the future no relationship between internal and external uh, details. Let me close now with one, telling you about a little bit of work in progress where we're, we're asking a question about, uh, about whether some of these patterns in aging I'm showing you might even be more general. Are these really specific to memory or might we be seeing something here uh, even more general uh, about, uh, about older adults? Now, what exactly uh, do I mean by that? The, this pattern that we've seen consistently of reduced internal and increased internal details for the uh, older adults uh, generally supports uh, the experimental recombination hypothesis. But 
the point we have to keep in mind is that performance on a fairly open-ended task like the autobiographical interview uh, is potentially influenced by other factors that are not, strictly speaking, episodic memory that could influence how people f perform under these conditions. Uh, so, for example, in, in studies of, of aging and narrative discourse, it's, it's sometimes observed that uh, older adults will sometimes produce a more of what's in that literature called off-topic speech than younger adults. So you ask them to talk about a particular topic, and then they'll start talking about something else. Well, is that something else, does that roughly correspond to external details in our studies? Maybe the older adults are kind of going off track a little bit, and that's what is accounting for uh, some of this performance. So there have been kind of two theories of these age-related changes in narrative discourse uh, associated with off-topic speech and related uh, phenomena. One, the inhibitory deficit hypothesis, and that's a well-known work of uh, Zachs and Hasher, our, our Buckle and Gold as well, and they invoke an age-related decline in the ability to inhibit task-relevant thought. Uh, another is what's called the narrative style hypothesis, and this is that in a narrative situation, older adults maintain different goals than younger adults. They may be less interested in, in unpacking all the details of an episode uh, in a very precise way than just conveying the general meaning of the episode, and perhaps that brings in more of these external details. So we wanted to look at the role. It seemed reasonable to us that this could be playing some uh, role in, in, in our experiments. And so we came up with a, a, a kind of a new task to look at the potential role of these non-episodic influences that we call a picture description task. So let me just show you briefly what the task involves. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have three conditions. Uh, this is work led by my graduate student, uh, Brendan Gesser. Um, one, we're going to have memory and imagination conditions, uh, similar to what I've told you before, uh, using these pictorial stimuli where we say, remember, try to remember an event that this scene reminds you of. It doesn't have to be strictly related, but just something that might be related to this. Try to remember an episode from the past or an imagine, imagine an event that might occur in the future uh, to you uh, related to, any, to one of these scenes. So memory and imagination conditions as before. We include a third condition now where we just say, tell us everything you can about this picture. Describe this picture in as much detail as possible. Okay? That should not, in a strict sense, require uh, episodic memory. And our question was whether the older adults would show the same pattern in this picture description task as they do during memory and imagination. If so, that, that would indicate the involvement of more, these, some of these more general narrative processes. So there are really two questions that we ask. One, do older adults exhibit the same pattern, reduced internal and increased external details during picture description as during memory and imagination? And then, are there any effects of aging observed? And if, if the answer to this question is yes, are there any effects of aging observed in memory and imagination even after controlling for picture de description performance? The bottom line is that the pattern is actually, qu uh, qu uh, number one, we replicate nicely our results for imagination and memory and aging uh, with, uh, with these pictorial stimuli, reduced internal and increased internal details for, the, for older adults. Uh, but you see pretty much the same pattern on picture uh, description. And we found the same to be true uh, in another uh, experiment involving just description uh, and imagination, where you get pretty much the same pattern. So clearly, there's something more general going on here. Uh, however, when we ask the question, are, the effects, are there any effects of aging in memory and imagination uh, conditions even after you control for these picture, of fiction, uh, picture description effects? Uh, we looked at this with a uh, multiple regression analysis, and the bottom uh, line is that while the number of internal details produced in picture description was a significant predictor of uh, memory and imagination, it's also the case that age adds something above and beyond that, although somewhat modest predictor. So there seems to be something more general going on in these aging experiments, possibly related to narrative style or in, in, inhibition, but there's also something specific to uh, memory and imagination above and beyond what you can account for with these narrative or inhibitory uh, theories. So then to wrap up, uh, I've talked about the constructive nature of episodic memory.
uh, and we've seen how various elements of the past are recombined uh, to uh, allow us to draw on the past in a flexible way to imagine possible future events. Uh, we think that this feature of the episodic memory system uh, is something that, while on the one hand being adaptive because it allows us to anticipate the future flexibly, might also produce memory errors. That's a connection that we're pursuing more directly now. Uh, I've shown you some evidence that the hippocampus plays an important role in, in recombining and probably also encoding details from past episodes into simulations of the future. And I think we've seen that uh, the imaging and data, uh, imaging and aging data largely uh, support the constructive simulation, uh, uh, episodic simulation hypothesis. There are other things going on, I think, that are interesting that we need to uh, account for. But I think the more, you know, probably the general take-home message from this talk uh, is that you know we as memory researchers typically tend to view memory as kind of a black box where we have inputs, uh, we put them into the system, we look at the outputs, we want to know how the system works, but I think that this work really encourages us to look more carefully at the functions of episodic memory and our idea uh, that we think uh, merits further pursuit is that we might usefully think of episodic memory as a kind of tool used by the brain that allows us to generate uh, simulations of, of possible future events, and we're hopeful that further emphasis on this adaptive aspect of memory will, will prove useful uh, in the future. Uh, thanks for your attention. I want to thank all the members of my lab, particularly Donna Addis, who contributed to this work. Thank you.